Thank you. It's been so wonderful to spend the last two days with all of you and to learn so much from so many of you. And I just want to take a moment and everyone join me in thanking Kurt and his incredible team for the fantastic work that they've done to bring us all together. Thank you. Woo! Woo! With that, I lost my pointer. Always a good start. <laughs> I think I just fix it. Well, while we're working on the technical issue I just created, um, I know that I'm standing between all of you and a glass of kava, a nice plate of tapas, so let's jump right in. I want you to meet someone. And is it possible to just go ahead and hit the slide from the top until we get started? Do you have the power? Thank you. I want you to meet this woman. For the purposes of today, we're going to call her Leisha. And we're going to say that Leisha lives in Nairobi. But really, she could be any one of 1.5 billion people that live in any number of countries, from Mexico to Brazil, India to Indonesia. There's a fast-growing middle class in all of these countries, and Leisha aspires to be part of it. But right now, that's out of her reach. Still, she does the best she can to support herself and her son, but making just 2 to $8 per day, there are real limitations on what she can afford. So Leisha struggles to secure the basics that she needs to realize her full potential and her dream for a better life. Basics like reliable energy in her home, high quality education for her son, even a place to store her savings, which she currently stashes underneath her mattress. And Leisha's struggles are exacerbated by the fact that there's a lack of products and services that are created for her and people like her. But that's changing. Today, people like you are creating opportunity for people like Leisha and doing it through impact investing, through spurring innovation and creating a path to scale. So as we've talked about over the last two days, impact investing is increasingly being used to solve problems not only for Leisha, but a number of pressing issues in countries around the world. And along the way, it's garnering a lot of attention. Together, we've learned a lot. But still, many of us have questions about where we fit and what to expect. Some people think, some people think that impact investing is, some people think that impact investing is unqualified win-win, that every impact investment should yield both market rate returns and transformational impact. Others see it as an either or, that you have to choose. You can either have market rate returns or transformational impact, but never both. So who's right? Well, the truth is not so black and white. From where we sit, we see a vast opportunity for a diverse set of investors, for foundations, family offices, high net worth individuals, for venture capital, for pension funds. There's a place for everyone to play. What's important is that you get in the game. Our own journey with impact investing at the Amidiar Network began more than a decade ago when Pierre and Pam Amidiar created the Amidiar Family Foundation, OFF, or OFF, with the mission of creating opportunity for people around the world. And at the beginning, it was focused on traditional grant making. But after a few years, Pierre started to get frustrated because at the same time, he could see the significant social impact that was being made by eBay as a private business. It was connecting people, starting businesses, creating jobs. And because Pierre could see the power of a business, of the market, for making a better world, he then created the Omidyar Network, O-N, or ON. With a, to deploy a flexible capital approach towards that same mission. So everything from for-profit investments seeking market rate returns to grants to nonprofits and everything in between. And so literally, we went from off to on. And since then, we've made about over $400 million in private sector investments and are on pace to cross the billion dollar mark in total investments next year. Along the way, we've learned some lessons. And we've shared some of those findings in two reports, Priming the Pump and Frontier Capital, out this fall. And we're still learning. 
So my goal for today is to share just three of those lessons in hopes that they begin a conversation and that perhaps they'll spark insights for your own work, regardless of the sector or the geography that you work in. So the first lesson is that you have to be really clear about the problem that you're trying to solve. That will be different for everyone in this room. We each bring our own passion to impact investing. For Omidyar Network, we knew we wanted to create more opportunity for people like Leisha in the low to lower middle income population. And to do that, we wanted to incentivize entrepreneurs to create products and services tailored to her needs at a price point that she can afford, solutions that just don't exist right now. And so that meant early stage investments in innovative entrepreneurs that are serving low to lower middle income customers. So why the low to lower middle income population? Well, today, most commercial investors target the elite and the middle class in emerging markets, those that make more than $8 a day. Meanwhile, many foundations and aid agencies are zero in on the base of the pyramid, those that make less than $2 a day. But in the middle, there's a massive group of people, like Leisha, where we can have a tremendous impact and do it through a market-based model. There's a potential for a tremendous impact in empowering low to lower income, low to lower middle income people because they live on the edge. Leisha, for instance, she's just one emergency away from a really rough financial situation. And I want to be really clear about what I mean by emergency. Raise your hand if within the last year you've been sick or you've had transportation breakdown. For you, for me, these things are an inconvenience. For Leisha, it could be the difference between aspiring middle class and falling back into poverty. But while she's vulnerable, she also has disposable income that she would love to spend on products and services that will make her life better. And that makes her an attractive customer to the right entrepreneur. And she is not alone. Collectively, the purchasing power of the low and lower middle income customers represent a $3 trillion market, a compelling opportunity for the next wave of investors and entrepreneurs. And that $3 trillion market, it used to be that not many companies played there, but that's changing too. Today, entrepreneurs are pioneering new business models and new price points for this big and fast growing market. Companies like Off Grid Energy, Servals Automation, MicroInsure are pioneering low cost solutions for energy, for healthy and efficient cook stoves, for insurance, insurance to catch customers like Leisha in times of emergency. And the one thing that all of these disruptive companies have in common is that they could not succeed without early stage risk capital. So for example, we were an early investor in Bridge International Academies. They, had, they believed that they could provide a high quality education to children like Leisha's son at an unimaginably low cost through an innovative school in a box model. In the beginning, the idea was unproven, but early stage risk capital allowed them to test it and de-risk it, bring in more investors, investors like NEA, Kosla, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, investors that can help bring it to scale. Since our first investment, Bridge has grown from just two pilots to more than 400 schools across three countries. Right now, most impact investors are focused on later stage investments where businesses are already right to scale. But if we want to give the next bridge a chance, if we want to create disruptive products for Alicia and her son, then there needs to be far more early stage risk capital. And bringing it back to the first lesson, that is the problem that we're trying to solve. The second lesson we learned that is that it's important to be purposeful about where you play. Just as we each bring our own specific passion to impact investing, we also have different appetites for risk, financial return, the type of impact we want to see in the world. Those of you who are sitting here today, some of you might want to minimize risk. Others might want to intentionally play where, commercial is the, where capital is the most scarce. The good news is that there's a lot of choices, but you have to be really specific about market segments. 
So just in the context of our own work, we've identified three distinct market segments that we think appeal to distinct investors. And I'm going to show you what this looks like. I'm going to walk quickly through each one of these. But I think the bigger point is that this idea of getting specific about risk, return, and impact in different market segments is a more universal lesson for the field. So replicate and adapt. So this is where proven business models are replicated and adapted in emerging market contexts. So witness, for example, Rocket Internet, which is taking business models like Amazon and Zappos and bringing to emerging market contexts. What's interesting to us is we're seeing a lot more activity in this space that's benefiting low to lower middle income customers, like Treehouse, which is taking the proven preschool, private preschool model and bringing it to underserved families in India. Now, these business models are already proven elsewhere. So this segment has the least risk. It's also the most crowded. There's a lot of VC flowing here. But this is not the place where investments are going to fuel innovation specifically for the emerging market context or to unearth the next wave of investments. That is going to happen in the frontier. And let's be clear, we call it the frontier for a reason. This is what's next. This is where investors can make their mark. This is where we can create disruptive products, services, and business models for people like Leisha. So in addition to being innovative, there are two factors that poise businesses in, the, in what we call the frontier for rapid and massive scale. One is an asset light business model, and the second is that they target a mixed income market. So to see this in action, let's take an example, a FinTech example from Kenya that many of you know well, which is M-Pesa. So between 2007 and 2014, M-Pesa rocketed to more than 12 million customers. As many of you know, part of the key to their fast scale was an asset light business model. They leveraged the mobile network to eliminate the need to build brick and mortar bank branches. And that factor, an asset light business model, is even more critical in emerging markets where debt is expensive and scarce. You may also know about M-Pesa and its impact. So when M-Pesa reached customers like Leisha, it offered a safe way to store, to begin a nest egg, to send money, to pay bills without having to take long, hard journeys on public transportation with bundles of cash. But what you might not know about M-Pesa's story is that at the beginning, M-Pesa did not target Leisha or people like her. M-Pesa's first early adopters were actually members of the young, urban middle class, customers that helped build an aspirational brand and to create the critical mass that M-Pesa needed to scale. And that is a key factor of businesses that we see in what we're calling the frontier, that they don't exclusively serve low to lower middle income customers. They go after a bigger mixed income market. But just to be clear, the frontier, it's not just about M-Pesa. The one or both of the factors at work in this example are also the asset, asset light business models and mixed income market. They're also powering companies like News Hunt in India, Geeky in Brazil, Verde Verdad in Mexico, and many more. Now, we all know that there are a number of innovative companies that don't meet these two frontier criteria, but have potential for outsized impact in the lives of low to lower middle income customers in emerging markets. Some of these companies might exclusively to, uh, serve low income customers. Others might be more asset intensive. And as a result, they, the, what we are calling Frontier Plus uniquely plays to the strengths and mission alignment of impact investors that are willing to push boundaries. Pushing boundaries requires leadership playing where commercial capital is scarce. Pushing boundaries requires creativity, perhaps longer time horizons to give these businesses a chance to scale, maybe venture debt to finance physical inventory. But with leadership and creativity, it can foster success. An example is Delight, a company that does not have an asset light business model, but was still able to sell more than 10 million solar lanterns and to touch an estimated 50 million lives, capturing 84% market share. That simple solar lantern can have a big impact on families like Leisha's. When her son gets old enough to go to school, 
it will enable him to study at night, to further his education. And for both, of, for both Leisha and her son, that simple light can broaden their future. And for the right investor, that simple light is a great opportunity. In fact, all three segments, Replicate and Adapt, Frontier and Frontier Plus, hold opportunity. Where you play depends on your appetite for risk, financial return, and impact. But no matter where you decide to play, the greatest impact will not be in investing in a single firm, but rather in an accelerating an entire sector. So for instance, if you invest in a single mobile money firm, you have a chance to provide basic financial services to thousands, maybe millions of people. But if you inv invest in accelerating the entire mobile money sector, you could help provide those services to hundreds of millions of people. Now, accelerating sectors, it takes time, sometimes decades. But if you can accelerate that process, even by just three to four years, it can mean getting, helping more, millions more, uh, more quickly. So to accelerate a sector, you have to look beyond investing in a single firm to the broader ecosystem that is needed and necessary for the problem that you're trying to solve. Investing in early stage market innovators is still critical, but it's important to do it not only with an idea, not only with an eye to the direct impact of that firm, i.e. the number of customers, but with regards to the, its potential impact on pioneering the sector. The reason is because some early stage market innovators will prove a disruptive business model, attract follow-on capital, and scale, but not all. Others will prove a disruptive business model and attract imitators to the space. They will end up being more successful than the first mover, or perhaps influence an incumbent to offer different products and services or to target lower income customers. And all of these outcomes have the potential to accelerate a new high impact sector. As these market innovators begin to mature, they face common needs, such as the need for consumer education, common standards, also, um, a, the, a robust pipeline of technical talent. And not addressing these needs can really stunt the growth of an otherwise burgeoning sector. That's why it's important to wrap your investments in a strategy for sector infrastructure and also policy. So for example, towards our goal of accelerating the mobile money sector, we not only invest in early stage market innovators like Paga in Nigeria and Ruma in Indonesia, but we also fund public goods that are critical to the success of the entire sector, not just the firms that we invest in. For example, we fund CGAP, which builds sector-specific infrastructure and conducts critical research. We also fund GSMA, which is an industry association that advocates for policy and regulatory frameworks that will allow these new mobile money uh, models to flourish. Now, investments in sector infrastructure, like research centers, training institutions, information exchanges, they're not always going to be profitable, but they are necessary for a sector's success. And public goods like these are great places for foundations to have an impact and a great example of how many different types of players can come together uh, to accelerate a sector. So there's a lot to learn about impact investing. I've shared just three lessons that are grounded in our own practice today. And over the last day and a half, you've heard many, many more insights from your peers and colleagues, from the people in this room. But I want to leave you with just two concluding thoughts before you walk out of here tonight. The first is to be purposeful. Be clear about the problem that you want to solve. For us, it's about early stage investments and innovative entrepreneurs serving low to lower middle income people. See the nuances in the market. Know your own appetite for risk, return, and impact, and be purposeful about where you play, whether that's in the replicate and adapt, frontier, or frontier plus. And do not stop at, at investing in a single firm. The biggest impact is gonna come from sparking, nurturing, and scaling entire new high impact sectors. And last, and if I could leave you with just 
one piece of advice, it would be this. Be bold. Be bold in the problems you're trying to solve. Be bold in your ambitions. Be bold in where you play. They say that VC is the art of seeing a wave as it's rising, but before it crests. If you're a VC that is willing to go beyond the comfort of proven models, there's a wave building in the frontier, and that's the future. Don't miss it. If you're an individual investor that has higher tolerance for risk, greater patience, the willingness to be creative, you can open up game-changing and entirely new sectors in the Frontier Plus. If you're a foundation willing to invest in catalytic public goods like policy and infrastructure, you can have an enormous contribution in accelerating high-impact sectors. There's an opportunity for everyone who wants to have an impact. Just be purposeful. Be bold. And the more we're purposeful, the more we're bold, the more we learn from each other, the more we'll be able to create opportunity for people like Leisha. There's still a ton to be known about how to be most effective and successful in impact investing. And I look forward to continuing that conversation with all of you, to continue to learn from all of you so that we can help more people more quickly together. So thank you for joining me on this journey.